Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, my name is Aaron Sato, and I'm the CSO of Twist Bioscience, and I'm also the head of the Biopharma team here at Twist. Just a couple housekeeping items to remind everyone, um, again, all lines will be muted during the webinar. Um, we will answer all questions after the presentation. Um, if you have a question, please submit it in the Q&A box rather than in the chat box. And, in, and then following the presentation, if you have one minute to take a brief survey, we would really appreciate your feedback. Now on to some introductions. Um, Dr. Tom Yuan is an antibody engineer at TWIST uh, and in the TWIST Biopharma Division. His work focuses on leveraging TWIST DNA printing technology to design, pan, screen, and characterize synthetic and semi-synthetic antibodies, both for our client-based and internal projects. Previously, Tom worked at Surzin, um, where he discovered and engineered bispecific Wnt agonist. Dr. Tubal Ben Yezkekel uh, earned his PhD at the Wiseman Institute of Science, establishing, um, developing, uh, enabling tools and applications in synthetic biology and bioengineering. He helped establish Synvaccine, a synthetic um, biology startup. And in, in 2016, he transitioned to loop genomics developing the first fully genetic synthetic long read DNA sequencing platform. All right, thank you very much, Aaron, for that introduction. Uh, as Aaron mentioned, my name is Tuval, I'm from Loop Genomics. Uh, and what we'll do in the next few, in the next hours, basically go through twist uh, biopharma technology for antibody engineering and loop genomics long read sequencing technology and focus on, on the synergies uh, by uh, the result from combining these two technologies and kind of show what they enable in the, in, the, in the realm of antibody engineering. But before we go into the actual uh, uh, work that's been done with TWIST uh, with our joint projects, uh, we thought it would be a good idea to go through the basic technology uh, that was used and that, that's kind of underlying this work uh, that really was the enabling technology that uh, enabled this work. So, just in a few words, uh, a few words about loop genomics. So loop genomics is a, it's a long read sequencing. We're based in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, and we're slightly different from, uh, uh, I would say traditional long read sequencing, uh, sequencing technologies um, in, in a way that uh, we're not developing our own hardware, our own single molecule long read sequencer. Instead, what we're doing is we're leveraging existing short read sequencing hardware from uh, Illumina and essentially transforming it into a long read sequencer uh, through a, a combination of proprietary sample prep chemistry and software. So this is just kind of a workflow of, uh, of how to use our technology. Uh, our chemistry shown here uh, um, uses as input any long DNA or RNA sample or molecules. Uh, our sample prep chem chemistry includes everything that you need in order to turn long DNA and RNA molecules into sequencing ready libraries that you can load onto any short read Illumina sequencer. The data that comes off of the sequencer uh, is used as input into Loop Genomics's uh, cloud-based software. That software does several different things that we'll go over today, but primarily what it does is it takes the short read data and transforms it into single molecule long read data, and then performs also some downstream analyzes on, on it. Uh, the fact that we're leveraging existing short read hardware from Illumina that is a very established sequencer with a pretty decent error rate means that the long reads that we can generate from this uh, have multiple advantages over existing long read technologies, uh, most importantly in, uh, in, in, uh, in the error rate. So uh, traditionally air, long read sequencing technologies have suffered from uh, low accessibility, high costs and high error rates. And uh, the fact that we've been able to solve this problem with an existing short read sequencer from Illumina has really uh, helped us address these challenges. So I guess, first of all, before we go into the actual sequence technology and how it works, I'll just show uh, one or two slides um, that describe the problem that we're trying to solve specifically with applying our technology to uh, antibody engineering and antibody sequencing and immune repertoire sequencing in general, uh, because our te sequencing technology is, is essentially a generic long read sequencing technology. It can be applied to any application in long read sequencing, but the focus of this talk is how we're applying it to immune repertoire sequencing and antibody engineering. So one problem that we're solving uh, within the world of antibody engineering is uh, the problem of how do you sequence uh, full length antibodies, right? So linking heavy and light chains um, um, in high throughput. So 
within the context of display technologies, if you want to sequence um, antibodies using a phage display library, if you want to pair heavy and light chains, you would typically have to go through um, a cloning phase where you would clone anywhere between hundreds to thousands of, uh, of phages, of isolates, uh, just based on your, on your throughput. And, uh, and for each one of those clones, do sample prep separately uh, in order to be able to um, link the heavy and light chains using a short read sequencer. You're, you can't do that using a short read sequencer unless you go through the bottleneck of cloning because short reads are just too short in order to be able to uh, span both the heavy and light chains on a single read. So the way that we're addressing this problem is that you don't need to go through the, the, this bottleneck of cloning. You can simply directly uh, circumvent cloning and directly do long read sequencing on your phage library uh, and generate accurate long reads uh, directly on, um, on the library without going through cloning. So you would generate single molecule long reads that span the entire um, antibody sequence, uh, the VH, linker, and VL. And you can do this now on a regular Illumina platform. So you can generate long read, full length, single chain SV data with extremely high accuracy. And we'll focus on the accuracy in a few slides uh, and completely circumvent cloning. So you can, for example, if you want to generate 20,000 uh, SCSV full length SCSV sequences, that would require you using existing technology to go to clone 20,000 isolates and sequ sequence them one by one, doing sample prep separately for each one of them. Uh, what we're introducing now, and Tom will talk about this uh, in a few slides, is how you can do this uh, by uh, through circumventing cloning altogether and directly sequencing uh, the, the phage, the phage uh, vector library with long read sequencing. So that's the first problem we're addressing. Second problem that we're addressing uh, is, in, in, is in sequencing immune repertoire libraries. So uh, um, a kind of very well-known problem in this field is that when you're sequencing uh, heavy and light chains, especially when you're sequencing heavy chains, uh, it's very hard to merge the forward read and the reverse read uh, using Illumina short reads. And the reason for this is because Illumina short reads are limited to paired and 300 sequencing and the ends of the reads have a pretty low quality score. So they're very hard to merge towards the end of the reads. That means that that region of, of the heavy chain with it, where the two reads uh, are supposed to be merged is very challenging to, uh, to obtain, especially with high quality scores. Uh, and also there's a certain percentage of heavy chains that's simply too long uh, to be sequenced using uh, short read sequencing. And those reads are just, uh, um, you simply lose them. Uh, and this, this is from a, a, a publication showing basically how the fraction of uh, heavy chains that you can actually merge, reads that you can merge, the forward and reverse reads, drops uh, based on um, where you place your primers uh, for sequencing. So this problem again, and Tom will talk about this, uh, is completely solved with our technology because you can place your primers wherever you want. You can make a full length read, you can make a 1.5 KB read, uh, and using loop seek long read sequencing and an Illumina sequencer, you'll be able to generate a single molecule long read that spans the entire heavy chain and completely solve uh, this type of limitation. So though th these are two examples of problems that we're solving in the immune repertoire and antibody development space. Uh, there are other problems as well, but uh, I, let, I will let Tom uh, focus on the problems uh, that he addressed using our technology in Twist Biopharma. Uh, a few words about how we're doing this. So how are we able to generate uh, single molecule long read data using uh, a short read sequencer? So shortly, uh, uh, the way that we do this, starting from the left here, is uh, we attach uh, a specific adapter. It's called a loop adapter to every long molecule in our sample. This can be a single chain FV. It can be a heavy chain, any, basically any long DNA or RNA molecule. Keep in mind that this adapter has many elements in it, but most importantly, it has a UMI. Um, in the next part of the prep, we make multiple copies of each UMI through long range PCR, not really important. The, the important part to focus on, which is really the heart of our chemistry, is this part here, the distribution step. What we're doing here is we're using uh, a set of enzymes that we've developed that catalyze the following enzymatic reaction. That enzymatic reaction takes this UMI information here and copies and pastes it into multiple positions within the same molecule but not to neighboring molecules. So it's an intramolecular barcode copy paste operation. So again, this barcode is now present in many, many copies throughout the length of the molecule, even this, is, this can be thousands of base pairs long. And the barcode hops randomly into these sequences, but not, 
but it does so intramolecularly, so within the same molecule, but not to neighboring molecules. Um, the following part of the prep is really just a modified version of the regular short read prep, where you take long molecules and you fragment them down to short molecules that are short enough to be sequenced on any Illumina sequencer. So this is the structure of the short reads uh, that come off the sequencer. Short reads always start with the sequence of the UMI, and then they're followed by the sequence of the actual long molecule next to where that specific UMI was inserted. So what our software does is it takes these short reads and it clusters them by their UMI. So it creates many, many clusters of short reads that share the same UMI. So for example, if we tagged a million long molecules here, our software will create a million clusters of short reads. Each one will have say two, three, 400 short reads. And for each one of those clusters, our software will run de novo assembly. So we don't need to know anything about your sequence. Uh, uh, and each cluster of short reads that share the same barcode will be used as input into a de novo assembler. And that de novo assembler will generate a single long read. And that long read will have exactly the sequence of the original molecule that was tagged by that UMI. Those long reads are written into FASTA and FASTQ files and are the raw data output from your experiment. So that's uh, in one slide how we transform a short read sequencer into a long read sequencer. You can see that there's nothing about this explanation that was specific to any molecule. Uh, this can be done for any application. And again, with this uh, presentation, we're going to focus on how we're using this in immune repertoire sequencing. Um, why, how is this different from other long read technologies? Primarily in two ways. One I already mentioned, and that is that you can use actually use a short read sequencing to do this, a short read sequencer. Uh, and um, maybe the more important reason is because the error rate is much lower. So this is from a recent publication uh, from Ben Callahan, um, where he examined the exact same amplicons uh, that had a known sequence uh, using, and he, and he sequenced them using three different technologies, PacBio, Oxford Nanopore, and Loop Genomics. And what he's calculating is the fraction of error-free long reads, long reads that have zero errors in them as a function of the length of the amplicon. Uh, so the three different uh, technologies are loop and red, pac and blue, and oxford nanopore and green. And what you're seeing is the fraction of error-free molecules. And you can see how a lower error rate leads to a much uh, milder decline in the fraction of error-free molecules as, as the reads get longer. So these reads are 5 kb, these are roughly 2.2 kb, and these are 1.5 kb. So you can see that the fraction of error-free molecules that you're getting is much higher uh, when you're using a technology that has a lower error rate. And the reason this is important for immune repertoire sequencing is because uh, you want to be able to trust your data. You want to be able to trust that mutations that you're seeing, that variants that you're seeing of antibodies are actually real sequence and not false positive results. Uh, right, so that's the accuracy. Um, the, and, and one way to, to show why this is important in, is what we call clonotype analysis or amplicon sequence variant analysis. So what we're doing here is, uh, and this is a secondary analysis after we, uh, that we run on the long reads after we generate the long reads. And what we're, what we're showing here is the number of ASV. So, so for those of you that are not familiar, ASV stands for amplicon sequence variant. Uh, it's basically taking the long reads in your data and clustering them against each other at 100% homology. What that does is it identifies all the unique sequences in the data, all the full length single molecule long reads that are uh, sequences that are unique. You can also call these clonotypes. So basically unique full length sequences in your data. So what we're doing here is we're counting the number of ASVs, the number of clonotypes or unique sequences in the data as a function of the number of reads used in the analysis. So what you can see is that at the beginning, there's a sharp increase. Every sequence, every read that we're looking at is a new sequence. But as we're sequencing more and more reads, uh, we're starting to see the same sequences over and over again until at a certain point, this plateaus. And you're, as we're sequencing more reads, we're just seeing the same reads again. So uh, that means that we've saturated the diversity in the sample. So when you're sequencing uh, immune repertoire libraries or antibodies, with a technology that doesn't have an extremely low error rate, this, this uh, graph will never plateau. It will always, as you're sequencing more and more, we'll, you'll always see new variants. But in reality, those new variants, the vast majority of them uh, are just false positive sequencing errors. So you wanna see this thing plateau here, and that means that you're using a sequencing technology that has a, a low error rate, and you can trust the vast majority of reads in your data. So that's just showing how our lower error rate um, uh, is actually important in immune repertoire sequencing. It helps you uh, identify the true diversity in your library. 
Uh, we're also very quantitative because we're using UMIs. We can cancel out any uh, PCR bias that might be introduced uh, in the process of sample prep. Uh, this is just um, showing the sequencing of uh, a synthetic community with known abundances and showing how the uh, expected abundance uh, matches up with the uh, measured abundance. And that's because, because we have UMIs on each one of the long reads. If a certain clonotype or molecule is amplified faster than others, we can cancel that out by merging all the reads that belong to the same UMI. And we're essentially single molecule counting at that point. So the, so the, the technology is very quantitative. Um, so that's really all I wanted to share regarding the fundamental technology, fundamental sequencing technology used uh, in this work. What I'll do now is I'll transition my presentation to Tom from Twist, uh, and he will be talking about uh, the work that Twist and Lucas have been doing together uh, in applying long read sequencing to Twist uh, antibody development work. So Tom, uh, feel free to take it away from here. I'm going to stop sharing my presentation and you can take over. Great, thank you. Okay, can everyone see this uh, presentation? Yeah, we can see it. Great, so great. Thank you to Val for that overview. Um, I'm gonna be going over some of the applications. Uh, so really quick, um, what is the core technology of Twist Bioscience? Um, really what it enables is this vast, miniaturiz vast miniaturization of DNA synthesis um, going from one gene in a 96 well plate to 9,600 genes on our twist silicon uh, DNA synthesis platform. So what this really enables for us is uh, instead of, you know, instead of ordering one gene at a time, um, we can really use this to generate vast oligo pools for building antibody libraries, which is what we're really interested in here at Twist Biopharma. Um, in terms of building the libraries themselves, uh, because we're 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 uh, building it base by base, you can really control exactly what gets incorporated into the library itself. So not only do you have base by base precision, you have codon usage control. You can vary the CDR lengths. Um, one way this really differentiates itself from traditional uh, library builds or mutagenesis is that um, you can you essentially. Uh, exactly order the oligo pools that you want for building the antibody libraries instead of only being able to control say a single position in the antibody and and have a certain codon use codon for those you can explicitly say okay it's cdr one two and three i want this exact sequence for those cdrs um, and i'll go over in in the next slides uh, exactly how we use this So in terms of using the oligo pools to build libraries, the way we, we typically use this is that um, for a, any heavy chain or light chain antibody, um, you wanna incorporate different CDRs um, into, into the library. Um, when we actually synthesize these, we essentially what we're doing is we're, we're synthesizing the oligo pools separately for CDR1, CDR2, and CDR3 that, naturally, that match the natural CDR repertoire. Um, we also screen for liabilities uh, within these oligo pools to remove from the library build completely. Um, amino acid liabilities such as isomerization, uh, cleavage sites, the amidation sites, and like constellation sites. Um, so we're using this as rational sampling from the desired sequence space. So once again, unlike NNK or trim uh, methodologies for building libraries, you can explicitly uh, you, you can explicitly insert or remove CDR. CDRs that you want to include or, or not include into each, each pool here. Um, I'm gonna be going, so as an example, one of the libraries that we'll be uh, showcasing in some of the data in this webinar is a library that we call the Ancestral SAP library. Um, these CDR sequences were taken from a, a patented natural antibody database and essentially shuffled within a single human heavy and light chain framework. Um, so, for example, for the heavy chain, there's 100 unique CDR1s, the light for, uh, for CDR1, um, 100 CDR2s, and 845 unique CDR3s. Um, and these are explicit CDRs taken from that database. Um, these are not positional uh, distributions for each position in the CDR. This also allows us to e easily incorporate length variations in each of these domains as well. Uh, another library that we'll be uh, showcasing some data from as well is what we call the AI hypermutated SCP library. 
Um, in this case, we're using two heavy chains and two light chains um, that underwent a deep machine learning neural network to generate the natural CDR sequences. And then there were, for this specific library, we actually linked the heavy chain one and two together in the oligosynthesis um, so that you have uh, canonical matching between CDR one and two. Um, and then CDR uh, three is also mixed in there combinatorially as well. So this is something you actually could not build um, outside of uh, the twist technology here. So just as a general overview, um, what does Twist Biopharma do? Um, we're mainly involved in the antibody discovery and optimization uh, pipeline in terms of the drug, the drug discovery pipeline. Um, our, our main, one of our main uh, advantages here is that we can generate a large number of libraries that are very focused on either specific targets, or we can generate libraries based off a parental sequence to a community mature and humanize at the same time. So we do that with both the Nova antibody discovery and our tau or antibody twist antibody optimization platform. Um, just as a general overview, this is a, you know, a plethora of libraries we've already uh, developed and validated. Um, these vary from VHH libraries, VHH uh, nano, nanobody libraries to fab, fab, dis, fab uh, libraries such as hyperimmune. Uh, a lot of our libraries are also based off single chain. Um, that either target specific uh, targets such as GPCRs or ion channels or more general um, libraries uh, such as the ancestral um, and structural SAP libraries. Uh, just to give you a quick sneak peek, um, this is a, uh, an array of SPR traces that we've identified using the traditional methods um, in terms of uh, library builds and screening. Um, and just to show that you know we can identify many, many high affinity binders. Um, in this case, this is to SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike protein. Um, what I'll show in the next few slides is how loop genomics has really enabled us to accelerate this process and actually discover new antibodies that we were not able to capture before using a traditional ELISA screening process. So in terms of the discovery cycle, um, we start with the panning selections and screening with our phage display libraries. Typically after this, we'll go into NGS and Sanger clone sequencing. Um, once we have the identified antibody fragments that we want, we will reformat those antibody fragments into full IgG, resynthesize those and scale up the DNA. Um, these get put through high throughput uh, IgG purification uh, in deep uh, 1.2 mil uh, 96 deep wall blocks. And then we'll conduct binding and functional assays for these as well. What I'm going to be focusing on in this talk is mainly the selections and screenings and how Loop enables us to, uh, to really expand on this. So if we look at the selections and screening, there's two main, um, main, main pathways here. If we have a soluble target, uh, typically we like using a uh, single site biotinylated target. Um, we will conduct four rounds of phage, phage selections or pannings. Um, from those phage selections of pannings, we'll individually uh, pick out clones and conduct ELISA screening. Um, once, once we have positive phage positive ELISAs, then we will select those positives and send them for Sanger sequencing. So Sanger sequencing obviously will give us um, heavy and light chain pairing, um, and then we will reformat those. Um, with cell-based targets, uh, we'll, we can conduct, conduct the phage selections, but we don't have a binding assay at this point. So, um, we, we want to be able to do NGS sequencing, but outside of loop, it's hard to get both heavy and light chain pairing for this. Uh, so the question is, how do, how do we get that? And the answer for, in our case, is actually the loop. Um, in the past, we had before, we actually had tried this before with cell targets where, uh, because we did not have an easy way of getting heavy and light chain pairing, we would actually go through and pick 10 384 wall plates essentially to get a, a, a survey, right, of the output, of the phage outputs after four rounds of selection. And uh, we, we wouldn't send those under Sanger because those would be, that would be cost prohibitive to, uh, you know, Sanger sequence 4,000 colonies. Um, but we would actually um, individually index on a plate, every single clone, every single colony, and then um, send that in for, for N traditional NGS sequencing. But as you can imagine, this takes a, a lot of time, this takes a lot of money, um, and it's much, much slower. And actually the, the number of sequences we get back is limited by how many you can actually, how many colonies you can pick. Um, and another thing to think about is 
in the ELISA screening for even a soluble target, you're, you're making the assumption that, and you're limiting yourself actually, because you're only screening, you're only able to screen the colonies that you can pick. So in an ideal world, we want to be able to, to also conduct NGS sequencing for the soluble targets, not just, not just do ELISA screens and then only Sanger sequence the ELISA positives. So for us, that, that answer has been loop genomics. Um, and I'll go over in the next few slides exactly how, what, how, how th this has enabled us. Um, I'm going to talk about a cell-based target actually first, um, a, a specific gPCR target that we used loop genomics for uh, to, to discover um, uh, functional binders. So this is what a typical selection strategy will look for for a gPCR target or other cell surface targets. Um, in this, we like using multiple libraries uh, because we have those multiple libraries for, uh, available. So in this case, we're using uh, VHH libraries, we're using SCFE libraries, and also a FAB-based library. Um, and in this case, uh, typically what we like doing is we like uh, uh, using two separate cell lines and then alternating between two cell threat side lines that are overexpressing the same target. Um, so what this allows us to do is focus the selection pressure to that specific target um, and decrease the, 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 the tendency for the antibodies to maybe enrich for uh, other uh, cell surface proteins on the, parental, on the parental cell surface. So in this case, we went through um, uh, four rounds of selection um, uh, with increasing uh, wash stringencies and decreasing amount of total antigen, or in this case, number of cells present through each round. So for this GPCR, um, what our typical process is, uh, is we'll take the round four, and in actually in this case, we extended to round five of the phage outputs. Um, we'll submit this to loop for NGS, long read NGS sequencing. Um, when we get those sequences back, uh, like Tuval mentioned, what's uh, important here is that we have, um, we have actually, uh, we can look at the exact amount of antibody, uh, the numbers of antibody clones within each round um, and how enriched they are in rounds four and five. Um, uh, we will actually also cluster these so that we're not uh, looking at explicit antibody sequences, but we'll look at highly similar antibody sequences. So the Levenstein distance is essentially just an edit distance. Um, so if an antibody sequence is less than three edit distances in terms of the VH sequence or the VL sequence away from another antibody, we cluster them into, a, we, we assign that as a single cluster. We then rank order by the cluster size and then reform at the top 95 to IgG. So what you're looking at here on the x-axis for round four um, is a cluster index. So that means that this specific antibody clone is the most enriched um, antibody that we see at round four. Um, and in this case, it appears over 4,000 times. Um, and then by round five, you'll see that uh, this actually, the same one actually extends to 70,000 times. So it's even further enriched in round five. Uh, you see this with both the VHH libraries and the SCFE libraries. Um, from this point, uh, we take uh, we take the top 95 plus uh, antibodies and then synthesize, reformat them to full IgG, synthesize, express, purify, and then and and then uh, uh, look at how they bind on cell. So uh, for the full cytometry binding assays of these NGS identified antibodies, uh, all I'm showing is just a general um, plate-based uh, overview of every single clone on that plate. Um, uh, in blue is the uh, Cho cell line overexpressing a GPCR and gray is the Cho parent. Um, so the high throughput, uh, uh, the high throughput IgG synthesis that we built uh, as twist allows us to essentially um, uh, you know, create these antibodies at 96, 96 at a time and then test them at high throughput. And so from this specific campaign, we're able to identify multiple um, multiple antibodies that bound to this GPCR. Um, uh, and what I'm showing here is the, is the flow data uh, at 100 nanomolar, so single concentration. Uh, once again, uh, blue is the Cho over expressing the GPCR and gray is the, the just the Cho parent. And this compares favorably to a commercial control. Um, so uh, this is you know, one great application and one great um, uh, instance of um, being able to find a, a, an antibody binder to this GPCR target. So uh, 
what I'm going to move into now is how using loop has also enabled us to actually expand on not just the cell based targets, but also the soluble targets. Um, so like I mentioned before, typically our process is to um, conduct the phase selection rounds, uh, screen by ELISA, um, re-array those positives and Sanger sequence, and then select those for reformatting the full IG and downstream testing. Um, so NGS sequencing wasn't at the time was not a not a huge focus, uh, mainly because of the cost and the time requirements that were were necessary to to look at the NGS sequencing. And what we realized that with Loop is that we can incorporate this into uh, not just the cell target screening, but also the soluble target screening. And 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 we wanted to see how much how much value we could extract out of that. Um, and so this is what we did for um, another soluble target uh, Y. Um, among three different library pools, uh, nanobodies, SCVs, and fabs. And in this case, what we see is that um, I'm showing similar graphs where the, 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 the x-axis is the cluster index. So that means uh, a low number would mean the highest and rich cluster. And the cluster size is how many times that antibody cluster appears in the NGS sequencing. Um, and in this specific case, we see uh, we can actually correlate this back to the, ELISA, the previous ELISA uh, assays that we did. And in this case, you see for the for the AI hypermutated ancestral SCP library pools, you see that the, the most rich most rich antibody is actually already being identified in the ELISAs. Um, uh, and but this is this is not always the case. Sometimes we see that the ELISAs actually don't capture the, uh, the uh, many of the um, uh, sequences that are identified by NGS. And the question here is are we missing what are we missing in the in the phage output pools or just by ELISA screening that we wouldn't be able to capture otherwise? Um, as another example, we see that for uh, another soluble target. In this specific case, the vast majority of the, um, in, in the green dots, the vast majority of the, uh, uh, these were already identified in the ELISA screening. So it will be, it will vary case by case. Uh, it will vary per target, it will vary per library, but in this specific instance, we are capturing many of them by ELISA already. But what we see is that actually for um, target Y, which I'd shown previously, if we go back and look at the top most enriched clusters and reformat them and test them, um, even though we had, we had no visibility with them in the ELISA screen, we'll see that many of these actually do, are, are functional binders. So what I'm showing here are some Carter, uh, some SPR kinetics um, from leads that were identified by ELISA screening to target Y. So this is an array view of every single antibody that we identified by ELISA. And you see that some of these don't, don't translate from either the SFB into a full IgG. In other cases, we have very high affinity binders. For example, this one here has a picomolar, picomolar level binder. Many of these are double digit or single digit nanomolar binders. Um, and, but these are, these are strictly from the ELISA screening. If we uh, look at the antibodies that were identified by the long read NGS sequencing, uh, for this specific case, well, there is actually a lot more antibodies that, that, were, that were uncovered by the NGS sequencing that actually were missed during the initial ELISA screening. Um, so you can tell there's, in terms of the, the raw number, there's a lot more antibodies here. Um, in terms of the, the affinities, you can, you can see already that many of these have extremely slow off rates. So these are picomolar level binders. Um, and this is not just for, uh, you know, just the nanobody libraries. So what I'm showing here is the nanobody libraries. For the SCFP libraries, we see the same, we see uh, 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 some additional leads here. In this case, many of them did not translate through, but we're still recovering three, three leads that we would have missed otherwise. So if we, if we actually rank order by the affinity uh, that we see on SPR for target Y um, and, and, and separate them depending on whether we had identified by ELISA in green here or by NGS in blue, we see that we recover many picomolar and low nanomolar level binders, single digit nanomolar level binders that we would have completely missed by the ELISA screening. Um, and this may be a function of uh, you know, maybe we just didn't happen to pick that colony, right? And the throughput is also much, much lower. Um, so the, the long read NGS sequencing really allows us to get a fuller view of the 
of the sequence diversity of the phage outputs around the later round. And as you can see from this, that there is significant value in doing this because we not only have, yes, the ELISA identified maybe uh, a few picomolar low single digit nanomolar level binders, but the NGS in this case was able to recover many more. So uh, I hope I've given you a really quick overview of uh, what Twist has been doing and how we've integrated loop genomics. Um, in terms of how uh, Twist Biopharma works, there's multiple different ways to work with us. Um, not only do we conduct our uh, 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 antibody discovery campaigns here, there is also a way you can also license our libraries. Um, you can partner with us to generate new leads. Uh, you can also partner with us to uh, optimize the existing lead. Um, and then you can also work with Twist to, uh, to generate custom libraries um, and utilize uh, the biopharma vertical for uh, screening and development. Um, and uh, a new project that we've been offering is the high throughput IgG production, which means that you can essentially just give us a list of amino acid sequences. Um, and all we need is the amino acid sequence of the heavy and light chains. And we will um, use our internally developed high throughput IgG production process to express purify and characterize these IgGs. And with that, I'd be happy, Tuval and I would be happy to take any questions um, uh, for, for this webinar. Thank you for joining. Great, thanks Tuval and Tom for a great presentation. Um, we're now gonna open it up for questions as Tom mentioned. If you have a question, please make sure to ask it in the Q&A box. And I see that there are a couple of questions um, in the Q&A box, which I'll ask to Tom. Um, they're actually kind of related to one another, so I'll maybe ask them together. The first one was, um, was there an orthogonal approach to screen SCFEs other than ELISA? And I guess this probably refers to the protein-based panning approach. And then as a sub-question to that, um, why, is, why in that ELISA are you missing so many of the sequences that maybe you found with NGS? Yeah, those are two great questions. In terms of an orthogonal approach to screening STFEs, um, if it's a soluble target, you can definitely look at other ways other than phage ELISA. Um, you could look at these in terms of expressing them as PPE um, or and using those purified PPE uh, to uh, maybe do an inline purification on the SPR machine for say a FAB or an STFV and try to get off rates that way. So that's one way. Um, why we're missing so many binders in the ELISA? That's a great question. Um, in many cases, it just could be that you're, you're not picking the colonies. Um, it is there. You don't always see this in every single target in every single library, but um, we do. And th I think what we had, had shown is an extreme case where <laughs> there was a, a, a lot of uh, sequences in the NGS that were that were not identifying the ELISA. Um, I think a lot of that may be just a function of how many colonies you pick and screen. Great, thanks, Tom. Um, another question. Um, it seems that the VHH H shuffle hyperimmune performs better than the other libraries in terms of binders and affinity. Is this always the case? Could you comment on the performance of the libraries compared to each other? All right, that's another good question. Um, we do tend to see great performance with our VHH libraries. Um, and although we do get many good good binders from the SCF, uh, from the FAB and the SCFV. Um, our initial thought is that this may be related to the, the, the level of display of the fragment on the phage itself. So as you can imagine, a smaller nanobody, single, single domain nanobody will, will display better um, on the phage uh, compared to a, uh, a, a dual chain fab, fab uh, antibody fragment. Great, thanks, Tom. Uh, maybe now a couple of questions for Tuval. Um, first one might be, um, uh, what are the read length limitations of LoopSeq? Yeah, um, so the answer to that is actually pretty simple. The read length limitations is basically whatever you can PCR. So whatever you can, uh, basically the read length limitations for LoopSeq are identical to the limitations of long range PCR. So whatever you can perform long range PCR on, we can sequence. Typically long range PCR works pretty well up to roughly eight, nine KB. So that's roughly our limitations. Great. Um, another question for Tuval. Um, 
how was loop seeks error recalculated? Um, that was calculated using uh, uh, clone DNA that was previously sequenced with traditional methods like Sanger sequencing. Uh, so DNA that was verified before, uh, uh, like a positive control, and then errors were calculated based on uh, mapping the reads, uh, the long reads that we generated to the known sequence of the positive control. And every, every mismatch was calculated as a, as a single base pair error. Great. Um, another question that's come in on the Q&A box. Um, thanks for the interesting talk. Could loop genomics pipeline be applied to sequence the eluit from a panning directly? Is there a need to array before sequencing? Yeah, so I, I can answer that. Um, that's exactly what we're doing. Um, we're, we're not arraying anything. That's, that's a, you know, that, 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 that's actually part of a, part of, it's a huge uh, time saver. Um, it also gives us much more data. So there's no arraying, there's no colony picking. Uh, all we're doing is PCR amplifying the uh, uh, the insert, um, and then in this case, sending it to loop for processing. Great, thanks, Tom. Um, maybe a question for Tuval. Uh, great talk, both. Um, what are the limit throughput limitations of loop seek? Could you resolve? a million different amplicons in a mixture? What about 10 million? Um, is it only limited to a final number of uh, phional reads? So for more complex libraries, you just need more NGS reads. Yeah, uh, again, the answer to that question is very simple. The, no, there are no limits. You can sequence as many long reads as you want. Uh, there's a very simple way for us to tune the number of long reads that we're sequencing. So if you tell us, you know, I want 10,000 reads, you'll get 10,000 reads. If you want 10 million reads, you'll get 10 million long reads. And each one of the long reads corresponds to a single molecule from your original sample. Great. Um, maybe as a follow-up to your comparison slide with other um, sequencing technologies, Tuval, um, how does the loop technology for long reads compare to PacBio and uh, Oxford <clears throat> or what are the pros and cons? Yeah, there, there actually have been a few interesting peer-reviewed publications on this question, just like I think in the past three or four months, at least three of them, uh, uh, people that sequence the exact same samples with both loop genomics, PacBio and Oxford Nanopore for various applications, starting from transcriptome to genome and microbiome sequencing. Um, and um, if you want to read those publications, you can go to our website to the learn section. They're all, they are all there. But essentially, I think uh, if you want to talk about the pros and cons, so the pros are that you can use an Illumina sequencer, which is much more widely available. It's essentially everywhere. Uh, so it's much more accessible. Um, the cost per base for short read sequencing is, you know, lower than long read sequencing. And, uh, and we're using a, long, a short read sequencer, so that's uh, easier for us to, to be affordable. And, but, but really, I think the most important difference is the quality of the data. Uh, and that's reflected through what I showed in my slide about error rates. So the fact that uh, our error rate is much lower means that after all the hard work that you're doing with all the panning rounds and, and you know, just the fact that you can trust the final data, I think that is the, the, the biggest advantage. And all those peer reviewed applications that have been published in the past few months basically show the same thing that the error rate is lower. Great, uh, maybe a question for Tom. Um, do you rely on the isolation of cells and cloning these at any of the steps in your process? Yeah, so the, the simple answer to this is no, actually. Um, there, after the phage outputs, we piece and amplify, send those, uh, submit them for long read NGS sequencing. Um, once we have those sequences back, uh, we take the uh, take those sequences, we format them to IgG, express, purify, and test. So at no point are we, especially with the cell-based targets, are we picking colonies or separating them in any way like that? Great. Maybe one final question for Tom. Um, was Twist able to identify functional antibodies to GPCR targets with synthetic libraries? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, we just published a paper in February in MAPS um, where we identified both agonist and antagonist antibodies to GLP-1R. So I'd encourage you to, to, look, to check that out. Um, so yeah, in short, yes. Cool. Um, so again, awesome questions. Thanks everybody for submitting questions um, in the chat.
Um, just a quick reminder that following this webinar, you'll be redirected to a brief survey. If you have a minute to spare, we'd love your feedback. Big thanks to Tuval and Tom for their awesome webinar today. And thanks everyone for coming. I hope everybody has a great day. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you.